Hello, Colorado, and welcome to the National Cybersecurity Center's Cybersecurity for State Leaders. I'm Maddie Gullickson, project lead for this initiative. We are excited to be with you today, especially given that this is our home state. For those of you unfamiliar with us, the National Cybersecurity Center, or NCC, was founded by former Governor John Hickenlooper as a nonprofit dedicated to cyber innovation and raising awareness of pressing cybersecurity issues. Our programs cover cyber education, election security work, and a co-development of the first ever Space Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Our mission is simply to do what we can to secure the world, and that's why we're excited about this program. Governments are huge targets for cyber attacks, not only for their data, but also for the fact that they deliver critical services. And as leaders in state government, you are the front lines in helping to defend against ongoing attacks. You are the front lines of democracy. By championing investments in cybersecurity for your state, as well as modeling strong cybersecurity practices for your colleagues and constituents, you're leading the way to a stronger cyber future for us all. And that's why we've designed today's cyber briefing with you in mind as legislators and legislative aides. We know you're busy, and so if you need to drop off at any point during today's live session, we've created an on-demand self-paced option for you to take to complete today's module. This can be accessed at any time via cyberforstateleaders.org. Once you finish today's briefing and take a short post-briefing survey, you will receive a certificate demonstrating your completion, as well as your dedication to advancing cybersecurity in your state. We've developed a dashboard on our website that tracks the number of certificates per state, so make sure to get your certificate, share it through your LinkedIn or social media channels, and do Colorado proud. All right, let's get ready to dive into our modules. We've broken our topics up into three main categories, including an overview of why cybersecurity matters at the state level, a breakdown of some of the major attacks you could be a victim of, and finally, an outline of some key steps you can take immediately to start better securing yourself. Some of the experts you will hear from today include former DHS Cybersecurity Deputy Undersecretary Mark Weatherford, senior experts and researchers at Google, Microsoft, and IBM, and we even have a special message from Shark Tank Shark and cybersecurity guru Robert Herjavec. And because we have limited time, we've added a section of additional discussions and updates on election security, small business administrations, cybersecurity resources, as well as tips from experts on how to prepare for and respond to cyber attacks. We're continually adding material throughout the year, so keep an eye out for ongoing tips and tools. If you have any technical difficulties during this briefing, please email us at cyberforstateleaders at cyber-center.org. Before we get really started, we wanna say a huge thank you to the speakers who have shared their time and thoughts with us and to Google for supporting this initiative and helping to make it possible. To kick us off, we're grateful to have NCC's founder, former Colorado governor, and now US Senator John Hickenlooper share a special message. Hi, I'm Senator John Hickenlooper of Colorado, and I want to personally thank you for participating in this training. By improving your personal cyber hygiene and raising your awareness of cybersecurity issues, you are defending the front lines of our democracy. As a former governor and mayor, I understand the challenges our communities face in preparing for and responding to cyber threats. I led our state through historic floods and wildfires, and the damage that can be caused by cyber attacks is not unlike the damage I witnessed in those incidents. Instead of brick and mortar damage, we see financial ruin, stolen identities, or potentially even more catastrophic, hacking our water or power resources. As state leaders, you are an influential part of how resilient your state can be against the ongoing threats of cyber attacks. We must all stay vigilant in supporting our state and local cyber and IT administrators who are working daily to secure our communities. And that means we must all stay personally vigilant as well. By improving your personal cyber hygiene as a state legislator or government employee, you are contributing to an overall culture of security and are making us all safer. Thank you for all you do to lead our communities. Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate your leadership on this issue and for making cybersecurity a priority in Colorado. And speaking of cybersecurity in Colorado, 
We want to kick off the discussion today on how cybersecurity is such an important issue at the state level. To keep things really local, we have Herman Stockinger, Director of the Office of Policy and Government Relations and Transportation Commission Secretary. He will walk us through how the 2018 ransomware attack on the Colorado Department of Transportation impacted the state and how legislators can support state agencies in defending against these types of incidents. Hello, my name is Herman Stockinger. I'm the Deputy Director for the Colorado Department of Transportation, or CDOT. And I'm here to talk with you about how our agency handled a cyber attack. On February 17, 2018, an attack began to occur on CDOT's computer network. This infiltration made its way through CDOT's network, affecting servers, users' computers, and data by ransomware. Every entity of CDOT's business operation was affected in some way, and it initially put the majority of communications and operations in the dark. Questions like, can we pay our employees? Can we pay our contractors? Did the attack include infiltration of our highway electronic sign network? Even the question of how do we keep 3,000 employees busy if they can't use a computer for an undetermined amount of time were questions we realized we really weren't prepared to answer. CDOT has experience with large scale disasters. In 2013, Colorado had unprecedented floods that washed away highways. We created an emergency response team to handle that disaster. One wouldn't think a computer software disaster is on the same scale as a natural disaster, but it really was. Similar to the response to our 2013 floods, we developed an emergency response team at CDOT. And on March 3rd, the state established a statewide unified command, including cybersecurity experts from the Colorado National Guard and led by the state's emergency management agency. Unified command not only focused on CDOT cyber network, but the larger potential vulner vulnerability to the statewide network. Our headquarters auditorium became a 24 seven command center where dozens of experts worked around the clock to find and eliminate threats. And then when monetary ransom deadlines were not met, a second intrusion occurred. Weak points were identified and the impacts continued to reveal themselves throughout the incident. On March 23rd, the program brought full resolution to the cyber attack. In the final outcome, CDOT never paid the ransom, and we built a stronger future for CDOT security. Between responding to the disaster and accelerating pre-planned upgrades, the disaster cost over $3 million. Being prepared for this type of threat involves instilling a mindset for all employees that the threat is real and involves preventative maintenance for systems and users, keeping up with the latest available technology to prevent attacks from happening, and the ability to communicate through multiple systems and diversifying resource dependency. Thank you for your time, and let's all keep doing what we can to keep ourselves and our communities safe. We truly appreciate you walking us through that experience. Obviously, keeping technology updated is a critical component as is enhancing the regular monitoring of networks. His discussion also raised an unsettling question that more communities are having to deal with, whether or not to pay ransoms in the face of these types of attacks. But it's not just state governments or large businesses that are dealing with this challenge. Cyber attacks on local governments have increased nearly 50% since 2017. Often the attacks look and feel similar to the CDOT example, where data and files are ransomed in exchange for a large payoff, usually in the form of cryptocurrency. Governments must be able to find or reconstruct a backup of the information being ransomed or pay. Attacks like these on local governments or hospitals or school districts are crippling because many communities struggle to maintain the tools, staff, and best practices needed to defend against criminals. If they don't have the needed structures and resources, chances are they don't have backups or monitoring in place to avoid paying the often hefty ransom. And every dollar spent to a cyber criminal is a dollar not spent in that community on critical needs and services. And this leads us to another important point. As we work from broad cybersecurity issues at the state level to your personal security today, we want to emphasize the varying levels of complexity involved in securing enterprises. Personal security can feel very complex, which is why we're excited to share the resources that we will today. 
but the time, resources, and strategy required to protect entire state and local enterprises is incredibly challenging. Basically, while the steps we will walk through later on will make you personally much safer, the, ste the steps to make state enterprises secure are far more costly and intensive, and your role as a state legislator is critical in supporting those efforts. While there are best practices, cybersecurity resources and tools are not one size fits all. And part of the challenge in navigating this policy arena is that fact. To move forward as communities, states, and a country as a whole, we must continue to learn what our communities need and how to maximize local, state, and federal resources to meet those needs. So faced with the complex state, local, business, and personal challenges, what can you do? Well, becoming aware of how cybersecurity impacts the lives of your constituents and your own life on a daily basis is a key first step. But in addition to awareness, there are practical steps that you can take as a policymaker and individual to proactively work toward a cybersecure future. Those steps are what we will cover next. We won't cover every major threat or all the tools in the toolkit today, but we are going to cover some fundamentals that will help you create a foundation for more cyber learning. And by establishing a strong foundation, you can continue to add not only to your personal learning and security, but to the greater policy awareness and security of your state. With that, we're gonna cover some key cyber attacks and why they succeed. Then we'll jump into how you can defend yourself. The first attack we're gonna cover is phishing. This is a huge one. Phishing attempts are everywhere and attackers have gotten incredibly advanced, studying our behaviors and fine tuning their approaches to exploit our vulnerabilities. In order to better prepare ourselves against this type of attack, we need to really understand what it is and why it works. Imagine checking your email and receiving an alarming message about one of your online accounts. The email says that your account has been compromised and it provides a link to enter your private information. The email sounds and looks legitimate, but it wasn't real. Instead, it was sent by cyber criminals looking to fish you. Phishing and spear phishing are some of the most prevalent cyber scams because they work. Phishing is when scammers send out mass emails, hoping to trick people into divulging personal and financial information by pretending to be a legitimate source, like a bank, a trusted retailer, or a delivery service. Phishing scammers often ask the user to reset passwords in an attempt to steal information. And unlike random phishing scams, Spear phishing, just like it sounds, is highly targeted and points directly at you. Spear phishing scammers might even use social media or other public information to find out personal details. Then, they use this information to craft fake emails that sound believable and real. This type of scam is one of the most popular methods used against people of influence, just like you. If you fall for a campaign like this, you may end up downloading malicious software or malware that can infect your device. Alternatively, criminals sometimes install a type of malware called ransomware, which is designed to block access to a device until a sum of money, often in cryptocurrency, is paid. Once criminals have control over your device, they can change your passwords, steal your money, and even your identity. The good news is that there are ways to help prevent phishing emails from impacting you. Knowing what they look like is the first step. No legitimate bank, government agency, or business will send you an email requesting that you re-enter your private information. Misspellings, poor grammar, and typos are also clues to watch for. If you receive a phishing email, the best thing to do is stop. Don't click anything in the email or share it. Contact IT support. Stay vigilant, take a breath, and think before you click. While phishing is a more obvious and prominent attack, it is important to consider the physical security of our important devices as well. As legislators, you may be an even greater target of this type of an attack. Here to walk us through that is security expert Maurice Turner. Hi, my name is Maurice Turner. I'm an election security expert. I'm here to talk to you today about the threats that you might face at the intersection of physical security and cybersecurity. The challenge with physical security is that sometimes those cybersecurity protection measures you have in place 
can be bypassed if an intruder has physical access to your device or systems. I'll start off with a couple of tips that might be helpful to you. First, consider using a second factor of authentication, like a security key. It works together with your strong password in case that strong password is stolen or somehow compromised through a data breach. Secondly, consider having an automatic lock on your devices. This can be as short as five minutes. So that way, if an employee steps away from a device, the system automatically locks without the employee having to do anything. Lastly, many mobile devices have built-in remote wiping or remote tracking features. These can be activated if a device is lost or stolen and turn that device into a digital paperweight. To help put this into practice, here are a couple of scenarios that can get you planning in the right direction. The first scenario, what would happen if you needed to evacuate your building and be out of your office within 60 seconds? What devices couldn't you quickly lock down? And what devices would remain open and unlocked for an intruder to potentially have access to? A second scenario to consider is, what would happen if an employee called you to say that their device had been stolen from their home office overnight? How would you be able to restrict access to the data that's on that device or to help prevent that employee from being impersonated online? These are just a couple of things to consider at the intersection of physical security and cybersecurity. And as always, practice makes perfect. It's just like buckling up when you get into a car. At first you had to learn it and someone had to show you, but now it's just second nature. So hopefully security will be second nature to you as well. Thank you for your time and especially thank you for your efforts in keeping yourself and our community safe. Maurice mentioned that there are tools to shut down access to your device if it's lost. For more details on this topic, we suggest you take a look at the one pager in the supplementary materials on our site for the associated links to the type of device you have to dive a little deeper into how to protect it if it's stolen. To close us out of this section, we're gonna switch gears to an even less tangible threat, but one that now takes place in our world daily, that of misinformation and disinformation. For this discussion, we have the NCC's Chief Strategy Officer and Re resident cybersecurity expert, Mark Weatherford, to share some insights. Hello, my name is Mark Weatherford, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the National Cybersecurity Center. I previously served as the first Deputy Undersecretary for Cybersecurity at the Department of Homeland Security in the Obama administration and was the first Chief Information Security Officer in the state of California in the Schwarzenegger administration. I also served as Colorado's first Chief Information Security Officer under both Governor Bill Owens and Governor Bill Ritter. The challenges of misinformation and disinformation are everywhere today. And while the recent Russian misinformation campaigns to distract American voters and the ongoing fake news about COVID-19 are front and center, they're only the most visible. History is rife with fake news. Everything from Sasquatch to the Flat Earth Society and aliens from Mars to the Pigman. Someone is always out there looking for new ways to exploit those people willing to listen. You may remember the Twitter incident in 2013 when hackers compromised the Associated Press Twitter account and tweeted that there had been explosions at the White House. This was a legitimate source, so most people, for a very short time, assumed the information was factual. The stock market even took a quick but dramatic dip following that tweet. I recently read a story about a sign taped to an elevator in an apartment building informing people that using the elevator would soon cost $35 a month. The tenants were outraged and launched a social media attack on the building manager, only to find out that it was a prank. Unfortunately, the damage was done and cleaning up the mess took far longer than starting it. A quote attributed to Mark Twain goes, a lie can travel around the globe while the truth is still putting on its shoes. With the vast reach of social media today, that quote should be amended to say, a lie can travel to the moon and back while the truth is still sleeping. Misinformation is simply false information, while disinformation is the intentional spreading of that misinformation. While the strict definitions are slightly different, disinformation is a challenge today because social media has created vast opportunities for sharing information that simply didn't exist just 10 or 20 years ago. 
Combating disinformation is a challenge, make no bones about it. But there are a few things we can all do, and they involve critically thinking about and evaluating information before sharing it. It's an unfortunate sign of the times that we should all be a little paranoid about what we read online today. Here are eight things to critically evaluate before reacting to social media clickbait. One, can you readily identify the source of the information and is the source credible? Sometimes it's difficult to determine, but if it sounds sketchy, it probably is. Two, are there multiple sources providing the same information or is it just one lone enlightened source? That's a red flag. Three, does it evoke a strong emotional response? Memes have become notorious for generating quick emotional responses because it's so simple to just repost or retweet a meme without even thinking about it. Four, does it sound absurd on its surface? Again, sketchy probably is. Five, check the dates. Stories and pictures often resurface years after originally posted, usually with just a new twist on the message. Six, is it time sensitive or is it gonna cost you something? These are always red flags. Seven, does it appear to be just satire or is someone just trolling for fun? Eight, does it leave you with questions like something seems missing here or these facts don't add up to a complete story? If so, maybe dig a little deeper before becoming another victim in the threat of disinformation. Disinformation and fake news are tearing at the fabric of our national and even global society, pitting family members against family members friends against friends, and political parties against political parties. All of us need to be consciously aware of how we're consuming information, and more importantly, how we're sharing and spreading information to ensure we aren't contributing to the problem. With some simple critical thinking, we can all be part of the solution. That was a lot of great information. And now that we better understand how criminals might be thinking about getting our information, we can jump into some key steps you can take to protect yourself. And again, this is crucial because the safer that you are, the safer your colleagues and constituents are. To try to make remembering some of these key points even easier and hopefully a little fun, we've outlined the top tips for practicing excellent cyber hygiene into a hopefully easy to remember acronym that Robert Herjavec, Shark Tank star and founder and CEO of the Herjavec Group has been kind enough to break down for us. Hi, this is Robert Herjavec. You might know me from Shark Tank. What you might not know is I'm a cybersecurity expert. You know why I'm an expert? Because I've been doing it for 30 years. I started in my 20s with mainframe security, did a lot of VPN and firewalls and all that kind of stuff. And today I run the Herjavec Group and we're one of the world's leading managed security and complex security companies. We do everything from design and consulting and managing large environments, including many government organizations. And we all know, especially governments, how much we are all under attack. The level of attacks is increasing at a rate never seen before. And it's just gonna continue with this post COVID world and everyone working from home in the digital economy, it's only gonna get harder. And you know what? You gotta stay smart online and don't get duped. And what does that mean? Deploy multi-factor authentication. Update your software regularly. Passwords, make them stronger. Your first dog is not enough or your kids' names, make them stronger. Encrypt your messages, files, and backups. Don't click on things you should. Thank you so much, sir. We couldn't have said it better. Now let's get into the details. To start with deploying multi-factor authentication, we're pleased to have Lucian Tio, Google's online global safety lead, to help clarify what multi-factor authentication is and how we can and should be using it. Hi, I'm Lucian Tio, online safety lead at Google. 
most of us are used to logging into our various devices and online accounts using a single factor of authentication, like a password. At this point, you would have learned how to create strong passwords, and you'd also know that you should be using unique passwords for every account you have. But given the growing sophistication of cyber threats, especially those aimed at sensitive information held by state legislators and government employees, you might want to consider using more than one type of authentication or what's called multi-factor authentication. Enabling multi-factor authentication is like adding a pin activated security system on top of your normal lock you already have on your front door. Multi-factor authentication incorporates different pieces of information like something you know, something you have, and even something you are. Something you know is the most common type of authentication. Passwords, passphrases, pin numbers, secret questions, and smartphone swipe patterns all fall into this category. These types of authentication are great, but adding at least one other form of protection is critical for good cybersecurity. Something you have is another type of authentication that requires a piece of physical hardware. This could be a USB key, a smart card, or a random code generated on a dongle. Codes sent to your phone via SMS would also fall into this category, though SMS authentication can fail if you should become a victim of SIM swapping. A better alternative for something you have would be an authenticator app such as Google Authenticator which requires you to have your physical phone in your possession. You could also use personal biometrics, such as fingerprint scans, facial recognition, iris scan, or even a voice print as a form of authentication. These types of authentication are more difficult to compromise. Most online accounts offer steps for at least two-factor authentication and keep an eye out for the common question of, would you like to use multi-factor authentication or would you like to enable two-factor authentication when you sign in or create an account? Your IT department can also help guide you to these options. Though any of your accounts that contain personal information should be protected, it is important to be extra vigilant with your email, social media, and financial accounts, as they are some of the most commonly targeted by cyber criminals and can be especially damaging for civic leaders and state legislators. Besides the obvious theft of information and finances, bad actors can use your accounts to pose as you and deploy harmful and inaccurate news and information. For additional information about setting up multi-factor authentication, contact the specific software or account you're trying to protect. But ultimately, setting up multi-factor authentication is relatively simple and significantly more effective than a simple username and password. And trust me, the extra steps you take to deploy multi-factor authentication on your account, especially in addition to the rest of the Duke practices, will make you safe. Thank you so much, Lucian. Next up is talking through software updates, why they matter and how to do them. Software updates are particularly useful in protecting against malware attacks. Here to share with us what to do is Ethan Chumley, Senior Cybersecurity Strategist for Microsoft's Defending Democracy program. Hi, I'm Ethan Chumley with Microsoft's Cybersecurity and Democracy team. And I'm here today to talk to you a bit about hygiene. And no, I don't mean the flossing or the scrubbing kind that are part of your daily routine. I'm referring to cyber hygiene, a critical part of keeping your computer system secure. If you're not sure what the hygiene looks like, just think of those little pop-up windows that ask you to install the latest operating system version, the latest app update, or that next patch. And I know, just like you, waiting to install those updates during an already busy day can seem tedious, but this is a key practice to maintaining good security. Getting in the habit of downloading and installing the latest software updates is an easy way to keep yourself, your networks, and your computer safe from a security incident. Why? Because when bugs or vulnerabilities are found in software, they're typically fixed quickly by the software vendors, but it is then dependent on you, 
to install those latest updates when prompted. Just like flossing, updating your systems is a routine preventative action that can keep intruders out and keep your data safe. Not to mention, it's a lot cheaper to be preventative than to clean up after the fact. We encourage regular updates across all of your devices, from the apps on your phone to the software on your laptops, even the smart fridge and Wi-Fi connected thermostats you may have in your home. Of course, your IT departments need to update shared servers and websites and backend systems too. Patching and restarting those shared servers might cause some downtime and feel inconvenient, but well-communicated maintenance windows during off-peak hours are essential to good security across all IT owned systems. Your security needs are ongoing and they're constantly evolving. There are bad guys out there hoping that you don't apply the latest patches and updates because you'll just be making their jobs easier. Many of the hacks we hear about these days were avoidable as they relied on victims' computers running old and out-of-date software, often a result of ignoring patches and delaying major software updates for weeks, months, or even years. If you're watching this video, that means you're a leader in your community. This means you are in a position to contribute to a culture of security. And as a leader, you're in the position to help your organization align to security best practices. This might mean allocating funds or asking your IT teams about how they're managing updates responsibly. And finally, it means you're in the position to encourage the community, businesses, nonprofits, and other organizations around you to practice good cyber hygiene, to make sure they are updating their systems and that everyone is encouraging one another to be vigilant about creating a secure environment. I thank you for your time, for your commitment, and thanks for clicking OK on that next update prompt. Thanks, Ethan. Now let's dive into passwords. These are one of the most challenging things to keep track of and potentially the source of our biggest vulnerabilities. Please join us in welcoming Stephanie Carruthers, the chief people hacker from IBM's X-Force Red Team. Stephanie is a career white hat hacker and is here to give us the tips the experts use to make and protect their passwords. Hi. My name is Stephanie Carruthers, or you can call me Snow. I'm the chief people hacker at IBM's X-Force Red. I'm so excited to be talking about passwords with you today. Now to set the stage a little bit, my team and I were a bunch of hackers. We're paid by organizations to find flaws in their cybersecurity before criminals do. Now with that being said, I wanted to say that I'm coming at this from an attacker point of view. As I'm talking about passwords, I'm also gonna be talking about how to make yourself more secure. So you might hear things like your password should be strong and secure, or your password should be long and complex. But what does that actually mean? First, let's take a step back to really understand how criminals can crack or brute force passwords. So let's say you're signing up for a new website and you enter in your new password. Well, what the website does is it takes that password, it scrambles it all around and it saves it in a database. That scrambling process is called hashing. So if a criminal breaks in and steals all the hashes from that database, they can't just read your password. But what they do is they use really powerful computers and word lists. Now, each word on the word list is hashed as well. It has that same scramble. So what they do is they take your hash of your password that they got from the database and they run it against their word list. And once they find a match, they know exactly what your password is. Now, here comes in the, your password should be long and complex. So if you take a password that's only eight characters long and let's just say lowercase letters, that could take seconds to crack. Now, if you take a password that's 10 characters long, let's say eight lowercase letters and two special characters, that could take hours to crack. Hopefully you see where I'm getting at here. Take a password that's 12 characters long and a mix of random uppercase, lowercase, special characters, numbers, just this mix of things that could take years to crack, which is perfect. A criminal is probably not going to wait years for your password. They're going to move along to someone else. Now, what do I recommend? I say to be safe, 16 characters, and make sure it's that complex, that randomness. You want to make sure you cannot read any words or see patterns. The key here is the randomness. Now we're on to our next issue of password reuse. 
So let's say there's a website you log into often. Let's go with your bank. And there's another website you frequent just as much, maybe a social media platform. When you created accounts on these, they probably had some type of strong password requirement. So you use the same one on both websites. Now, maybe that social media platform had not a great security posture. An attacker was able to hack in, steal the hashes, crack your password, and they now have your username and password. Well, attackers are clever. They know that you probably use the same password through different logins. So they might try them at other places like your bank. Now, that is an issue, but to combat this, we can use password managers. Now, password managers is a place, think of it like a database that stores all of your usernames and passwords to every login that you have. Now, there's many options for password managers. Most of them even have free tiers for the everyday consumer. So what you do is when you sign up for an account, it can be a little tricky, especially as you're adding in all of your accounts, but I promise you it's worth it in the long run. And even as you're signing up for new accounts, they do things like they generate those long, random, complex passwords for you, so you don't have to think of them yourself. They also autofill for you, so you don't have to go in and, and dig through things and try to find your password. There's um, lots of conveniences. They have mobile apps. They have browser plugins. They're definitely there for your convenience. So you might be thinking to yourself, great, I've solved a couple of issues. I know how to make a long, complex password to my password manager, and my password manager stores all of my unique login credentials. Now, what happens if an attacker actually gets the password to my password manager or still another website that has a long, complex password? Then what? Well, this is where multi-factor authentication comes into play. Sometimes it's referred to as two-factor authentication. Essentially how it works is if you log into a website and you supply your username and password, you still have to supply a second factor. Now that might be a code in a text message or something you have to approve on an app on your phone. There's different ways that this can work, but essentially if the attacker doesn't have that second code, they can't log into your accounts. Now it's really important that you deploy this everywhere you can across every account. Typically it's under a security settings in your account. Now, this isn't a silver bullet. Attackers are getting crafty. Sometimes if they try to log into your account and you do have 2FA, what they might do is launch a social engineering campaign against you. They might call you claiming to be the bank and they need to verify you. So you need to confirm a code that you just received or they might text you and say, hey, I used to have this phone number. I accidentally sent my code to you. Can you give it to me? Under no circumstances should you ever give out this code. No organization is gonna call you for your multi-factor code or for your password for that matter. All right, a couple of takeaways. Your password should be at least 16 characters and random. The randomness is key here. You should also have a different password for every account you log into. You can use a password manager to help you do this and even help you generate those long and complex passwords. And also enable two-factor authentication on every account possible. Thank you so much for your time and keep doing what you're doing to keep ourselves and our community safe. Thank you. Stay safe. That was a great explanation, Stephanie. While 16 characters may be a little daunting, think about it this way. If you use a password manager, and there are several now, examples include LastPass or Keeper or Dashlane, then you really only have to come up with one super complicated password, and that will help keep you way more secure online. Next, we have encrypting emails and files and backing important files up. These two are thrown together because they are complementary. They both help protect against malware attacks and help protect you in case someone does get into your stuff. Our presenter on this is NCC board member, Leslie Kershaw from Siren Solutions. And we're excited for her to share her 20 plus years in cybersecurity to talk through encryption and backing up files. Hello, my name is Leslie Kershaw and I've spent 20 years in the field of cybersecurity. First, as an NSA offensive cyber operator using attack methodologies to gain access to systems on behalf of our government. Later, I used those insights to help commercial entities 
harden their defenses. What I've learned over the years is that security measures cannot be overly cumbersome, otherwise users will not implement them. While the best security is to avoid technology altogether, that's just not realistic. The other thing that I've learned over the years is that no matter how good your security, a determined attacker given enough time, resources, and incentive will gain access to the systems and information that they want. For you, this means that you should do your best to implement tools that make it difficult for an unskilled or moderately skilled attacker. When faced with advanced aggression, the best solution is to formulate a good recovery plan. Today, we'll talk about encrypting email to prevent sensitive data from being viewed by unintended recipients. We'll also talk about how to back up data so that you can recover if you are the victim of, a, of an attack. Before the internet, we relied on the postal service to deliver messages for us. When we were on vacation, we would send those glossy postcards filled with details about the fun times that we were having. We didn't care if anybody saw them. When faced with difficult news to share, we would write a letter and fold it into an envelope. We may even buy envelopes that had additional security to protect the sensitive information of our writing. When we think of our email messages, we should think of them in the same way. Unencrypted email is that postcard that anyone can read with limited tools and knowledge. When we communicate sensitive information, we need to use encryption to wrap our message in that protective envelope. There are three mechanisms that you can use to encrypt messages. I'll go from the simplest methodology to the most difficult. The first is through enterprise encryption. This will be set by your organization's IT staff. The encryption will leverage S-MIME, which allows for the encryption of any type of data that you would like to send. They will issue you a signing certificate that can be tied to your email. Once you install this, you'll simply check the encrypt email button or the lock button to encrypt your email message. As long as your intended recipient's organization also supports an encryption management server, you can send and receive without issue. Leveraging this will take care of 80% of your sensitive communication. If you want to send an email to someone who does not have encryption management at or their organization, or you just want to add an extra layer of protection, you can encrypt the document itself. To do this, if you're on a Windows system, you can select to WinZip the document and then add the password. If you're on a Mac system, you can just set a password under under a file. Make sure that you send the password over the phone verbally or through a text. Do not send it in the email because if an attacker has access to the recipient's email, they can unencrypt your message. The last method is to use PGP on your email account and exchange keys with the intended recipient. The install and use of this goes beyond the time that we have left in this video, but there are great resources on the internet that can help you. The only drawback of this method is that it only encrypts plain text emails. Encrypting emails will help you thwart lower level attackers that attempt to pry into your personal data. Advanced attackers will use sophisticated methods to access your information and may even try to cause damage. Trying to recover from an attack is an emotional and time consuming endeavor. It's best to prepare for it potentially happening by treating it like insurance. You build up the method to recover knowing that you might someday need it. Imagine that you knocked over a cup of coffee onto your computer right now and it won't restart. How would you recover all of that data? The simplest method is to back up your data in an automated way. Once the automation is set, you will never have to think about it again until it's time to recover. I like to use an external drive that I connect via USB to my USB docking port. That way, anytime that I connect my laptop to my external screen, which is also on my docking port, I'm setting up the automated backup without even thinking about it. If you're using a Windows system, just go to your system, then settings, then updates, and security. You'll select that external drive that you just connected via USB. You'll set the interval and the backups will begin. If you're using a Mac, you have two methods available to you. The first is to connect to iCloud. You'll select the drives and the documents that you want to be automatically updated 
and they'll take care of that for you. The good thing about that methodology is that you can also access those files on different devices. You can also set up your Mac for external drive automated backup in a similar way. You'll just go to system preferences, select the time machine and follow the prompts. I hope that you never have to recover your files or that you're a victim of an attack. But if you are, I hope that this helped you prepare. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Leslie. I think one of the things that's helped me quite a bit in remembering to conduct regular backups is setting a calendar alert. Well, we have the final topic coming up next, and that's how to avoid clicking on things you shouldn't and what to do if you accidentally did, because let's be honest, we've all been there. To share about how to protect against this, we're pleased to welcome Google's Sunny Consalvo, researcher and security and privacy user experience team lead. Sunny, thank you so much for being here. A researcher at Google who focuses on security, privacy, and abuse topics. By now, you've learned a lot about how to avoid email phishing campaigns. So in this module, we're going to dive a bit more deeply into how to be aware of what not to click on when it comes to web pages and what to do if you accidentally do. Let's be honest, we've all done something we shouldn't have. We've all clicked that link. You know, the one that takes you to a shady website or starts to download something onto your computer. So what are some ways to avoid doing that? First, let's talk about how you might figure out that you're on a shady web page. One sign might be that if you try to leave the page, you get bombarded with a pop-up asking you some version of, are you sure you wanna leave this page? Or maybe install our antivirus program. That should be a red flag right there. Another sign might be that you get a pop-up to sign up for more information, especially if it's hard to click out of that before you've even reached the actual content. If the site is only mildly shady, be careful to not share any personal information or sign up for anything on your way out and just X out of that tab. But if it won't let you out, try closing out of your browser entirely. If that doesn't work and you're on a Windows computer, go to your Start button and look for your Task Manager. From your Task Manager, look for your internet browser in the list, select it, then end that task. If you're on an Apple computer, go to the Apple menu, select force quit, then look for your internet browser in the list and force it to quit. At this point, it would be a good idea to open your antivirus software and run a scan. If you're unsure how to do this, check in with your legislative IT staff or your personal organization's IT staff to walk you through those steps. Though you may end up on less savory sites through simple internet searches, Another way can be from links you receive in an email or text message. Before opening a link from a text, make sure you know who sent it to you, that it's someone you trust, and then it really is them who's sending it. If you don't know who it is or are suspicious that it might not really be who you think it is, don't open it. You can always contact the sender another way, for example, by giving them a call, just to make sure it's not a phishing attack. And when it comes to email, there are several tools you can use to proactively scan for malicious links or attachments. If you wanna check where the link leads to, hover over it and make sure you recognize the source and that the source in the hover matches what's in the email. It's a good idea to check the source in your internet searches too, to make sure the domain you're about to click on is the right one. Most email platforms now have some type of alert or warning to draw your attention to a potentially suspicious content. With Google's Advanced Protection Program, for example, even more stringent checks are performed before you try to download something. Advanced Protection flags and may even block file downloads that may be harmful. These steps to protect yourself aren't done in a vacuum. Remember to keep all of your software, apps, and devices updated and ask IT for support in installing trusted antivirus software, firewalls, and email filtering. And of course, always back up your files. Criminals can't make you pay for information you already have. If you think your computer or device may be acting in a strange or suspicious way, or if you're simply unsure whether something is wrong, reach out to IT for help. Stay alert, practice good cyber hygiene, watch the other videos in this series for more information about what to look out for, and whatever you do, if you're not sure about it, don't click it. Thanks so much for your time. 
Your diligence keeps us all safe. Thank you, Sunny. Another key thing to remember as you're looking at various sites is whether there's a padlock at the top left of the URL bar or where the web, where the web address is. If there is one, chances are it's more secure. Well, that's it for us today. But before we hand off the discussion to Colorado State CISO and cybersecurity champion, Debbie Blythe, we, wanted, we do wanna highlight a few last resources. First, if you as legislators or legislative aides or staff observe any suspicious IT-related activity, unusual events, or potential threats, please report those to legislative IT support as soon as possible. To do this, call 303-866-5849 or email ithelp.g as in golf, a as in alpha, at state.co.us. You can also contact Senior Information Security Analyst Larry Hofer at 303-866-3487 or email him at Larry, L-A-R-R-Y dot H-O-F-E-R at state.co.us. Please be careful to not forward any suspicious links or emails. Lastly, we are excited to announce the launch of an app co-developed with Resolute Cybersecurity Cyber Strategy, excuse me, created specifically with legislators and staff in mind. The app is a one-stop shop for cyber awareness and personal incident response planning, updates on cyber news, and ongoing resources. We have the link to download the free app on our website at cyberforstateleaders.org, and you will also receive the link via a follow-up email after this briefing. Please remember to take the short survey to get your certificate and share your commitment to cybersecurity. You'll be automatically added to our newsletter that will share ongoing security tips and access to roundtable discussions on various issues. Please feel free to share that newsletter with your colleagues and constituents. We genuinely hope you learned something and can incorporate some new habits into your cyber routine. We look forward to staying connected and appreciate all you do to serve our great state of Colorado. Debbie, Thank you again for all of your support and hard work to make the state of Colorado safer. Go ahead and take it away. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for your attendance today. I really do appreciate your interest, your support, and your attention to cybersecurity. So I am Debbie Blythe, and I am the State Chief Information Security Officer. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do in my role, what my scope of responsibilities are. I'm going to talk about the attacks that we defend against and also the history and background of Colorado's cybersecurity program. I'm going to talk about ransomware and I'm going to give you some context around the size of the threat. And I'm going to talk about unemployment insurance fraud because I certainly have been a victim of this and maybe you have too. I'm also going to talk about cybersecurity challenges that we face in the state of Colorado and where we need your help. And then I will save plenty of time for questions at the end. So my team, uh, we're responsible for setting statewide policies and also for the cybersecurity strategy. And we manage the annual budget for cybersecurity for 17 executive branch agencies, those consolidated agencies of the executive branch. We also report on enterprise security risk and we track audits. We help facilitate all of those IT audits that are performed against those executive branch agencies. And then we track remediation efforts as well. We perform proactive security, so risk assessments for all of our critical and essential applications that OIT manages on behalf of the agencies. There's about 150 of those. We also assess vendor compliance with state security policies and with regulatory requirements. And we participate in all new projects to ensure that systems and implementations are architected and coded securely. We manage all state user identities, including for about 30,000 state employees and then another 30,000 county and other workers who access state systems. And we provide quarterly security awareness training for all state employees. And then lastly, we perform security monitoring and incident response. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. 
So you're probably wondering, what do we do for non-consolidated agencies? They still have to abide by the statewide cybersecurity policies that we set. And so we do collaborate and we include them in our process each time we update to make sure that we're incorporating their input and to ensure that the resulting policies are something that we can all adhere to. Now, non-consolidated agencies are required to submit annually an agency cybersecurity plan. We review these and we provide feedback as needed. We also conduct, conduct a monthly security leaders meeting in which security leaders from each of these non-consolidated agencies participate. And in fact, the leader of security for the legislative branch, including the General Assembly, Larry Hofer, he also participates in these meetings. Now these monthly meetings help us to have statewide alignment on strategy as it makes sense. And we also provide consulting and guidance as requested. And this goes in both directions. So we advise each other. Now we also share threat intelligence information broadly across state agencies and also local governments. And for those agencies who use the Colorado State Network to get to the internet, they are beneficiaries of best of breed security that we have built into the Colorado State Network. Now you will notice that the legislative branch is not consolidated. So for the General Assembly, Larry Hofer is your security contact, and he does conduct security awareness training for you that I would encourage you to take advantage of regularly. Now, the state of Colorado is constantly under attack. We experience more than 8 million security events each day. And a security event may be as benign as a mistyped password, or it could be as as serious as an actual indicator of an attack in progress. So we have deployed a security strategy that we call defense in depth. So firstly, we stop threats from coming in. Now, if they make it past that first defense, then we detect them and stop them on the end point. And if they make it through those first two defenses, then we block the malware from communicating outbound to the internet. And of course, if all else fails, we are ready to respond quickly to contain and eradicate threats as needed. So as you heard earlier, the number one way that malware gets into an organization is through email. Now, more than half the email floating around on the internet is actually spam, and that is consistent year over year. And when an email includes a malicious attachment, half the time these are office files. In fact, last year we assisted a county who was completely crippled by an email attachment. This came into their environment disguised as a Microsoft Word document called invoice. So of course, thinking it was an invoice, you would open that and click on it, at which time the county was infected with a very debilitating type of malware. Now for this county, as is true with most types of malware, the only way to recover is to actually completely wipe and reinstall all infected systems. Now there was a 64% rise in email threats in 2020. In fact, every year sees more threats than the prior year. Now, Google, our email platform, has some spam protection built in. However, we have seen over and over that Google's email protection just is not robust enough for us. So in 2019, we implemented a best of breed email filtering tool that gives us much more robust email filtering and blocking capabilities. So after e after Google gets done blocking the threats that it blocks, our email filtering tool blocks another 32,000 emails per month. So this chart that you're looking at represents all of the email that we blocked using this tool in first quarter of this year. It was more than 96,000 messages, which were directed at state employees specifically, and they were very stealthily crafted to escape most email filters. In fact, these threats would certainly have made it into our environment without this tool. So, as I mentioned, for threats that make it past this tool, we do detect and we stop threats on the in on the endpoint. We have an endpoint detection and response tool that is deployed to all servers, all workstations, and all laptops. Now, this tool is very powerful, and it's 
much smarter about detecting threats in our servers, workstations, and laptops than any of the old antivirus software that you've heard of in the past. So this tool is actually successfully blocking between 50 and 350 critical and high-risk threats per month. And these were threats that were not previously being blocked by any of our other endpoint security tools. So this tool has successfully prevented several security incidents that would have otherwise been extremely impactful to any agency. And it works whether our employees are connected to the state network or they're working from home or they're working from someplace else in the, work, in the world. Um, this tool ensured that we had maximum security to enable a fully remote workforce during our COVID response. Since this tool does not require employees to be connected to the state network in order for it to remain up to date and for them to remain fully protected. Now, because of this tool, state systems are better protected than ever before, and the threat of a successful malware or ransomware attack is greatly reduced. Now, if malware escapes all of our controls, the email filtering and the endpoint detection, once that malware is installed, most types will try to make a connection outbound to the internet, to what is called a command and control server and it checks in with this malicious server to get instructions on what it should do next. Now, our firewalls are detecting and blocking this outbound traffic, and not just for executive branch agencies. Many non-consolidated agencies and institutes of higher education are also using the Colorado State Network, and we are keeping them protected as well by our state firewalls. Now, because as you've heard, attackers are very persistent, and very well funded, um, we are prepared to respond quickly when needed. Our security operations center is constantly monitoring for security incidents, and they have help from the multi-state information sharing and analysis center. We have something called Albert sensors in our environment, and they are monitored and then they alert us when they see security incidents. We also have ma a managed security service that monitors our endpoint detection and response tool set and they help to respond to any security events. And we have an incident response plan in place. It is well rehearsed and it is kept up to date. And we use that to respond to any security incidents that we see. So I wanna talk about and give you a little bit of history and background of Colorado's cybersecurity program. So Colorado's cybersecurity strategy is guided by an approach called Secure Colorado. This is our multi-year cybersecurity plan. Now, the two main goals of this plan are to continue to reduce risk and the likelihood of successful cyber attacks and to justify an ongoing budget for cybersecurity improvements. Now, as a framework and to ensure that we maintain continued focus on those controls that provide high value and the most cost-effective risk reduction, we use the CIS critical security controls. This is a framework that consists of 18 controls with several, several sub-controls each. And it's continuously evolved by industry experts from the Department of Defense and other federal entities, such as the private sector. Um, and it takes inputs from the threat landscape to ensure that each of these controls are the controls that will provide us the very best protection from current and emerging threats. And this is how many states, including the state of Colorado, are operationalizing the NIST cybersecurity framework. Now, our policies are based on NIST, as is the CIS critical controls, which is why we believe that this is the right framework for the state of Colorado. Now, I'll talk a little bit about our budget progression and some of the accomplishments that we've been able to make with that budget. So back in 2012, there was no security consistency between agencies. Some agencies were more mature in their cybersecurity strategies. Some agencies were not mature at all. There was also no budget for security improvements. So this is sort of when Secure Colorado was being created. By 2014, the Secure Colorado strategy was implemented. And we had successfully allocated a modest budget for security program improvements. And we had deployed a standard antivirus across all of the state. We were rolling this out. 
Other security improvements were also underway and the budget was estimated to be about 1.3% of the overall IT statewide spend. Now, the overall IT statewide spend is estimated to be approximately $350 million annually. And this estimate includes both what OIT spends as well as what agencies spend on technology and IT services annually. Now by 2016, we had implemented a best of breed next generation firewall at our perimeter. And we had implemented two-step verification for Google. We had also implemented more than 600 audit recommendations that had been outstanding for years and years and years. And our budget at this point was estimated to be 2.5% of the overall IT statewide spend. By 2018, we had purchased and we were implementing that endpoint detection and response tool set that I had mentioned. And we had launched a project to update all agency firewalls to our best of breed firewall. We also were implementing an identity and access management tool set to manage all of those statewide user identities. And the budget was estimated to be about 3.6% of the overall statewide IT spend. Now, 20 and 21 were really exciting years for us in improving our cybersecurity. In 2020, we effectively doubled our cybersecurity budget so that we could accelerate the completion of security projects that were already underway to reduce the likelihood and impact of another successful cyber attack. And we continued to remediate outstanding audit findings and to fix other known gaps in our environment. At this point, the cybersecurity budget was estimated to be about 6.2% of the overall statewide IT spend. And for fiscal year 22, we will be sustaining and maintaining those processes, tools, employees, and salaries that we implemented in 2020. And of course, we'll be continuing cybersecurity improvements across the state. The budget is estimated to be about 4% of the overall statewide IT spend. Now, we aren't done because security is never done. So we will continue to assess our program for weaknesses and gaps, and we will request money along the way to continue to improve cybersecurity for the state of Colorado. So you may be wondering, how do we compare with other states? Well, Deloitte and the National Association of State CIOs, NASIO, conducts a national state cybersecurity study every two years. And this study is a fantastic source to provide information on what other states are doing. Now, according to this study, most states spend between 1% and 3% of their overall statewide IT spend on cybersecurity. Now, Colorado spends slightly more. So we are in the top 22% of the best funded states in the nation. Now in 2018, a new category was created because 10% of the states in the nation are now spending between six and 10% of their overall IT spend on cybersecurity. And as we have done historically, we will continue to identify opportunities to make thoughtful budgetary requests to in incrementally improve our cybersecurity spend over time. Now, we are very proud of Secure Colorado, our cybersecurity strategy. We have received nationwide recognition and numerous awards for providing quick and sustainable risk reduction, for innovation in cybersecurity, and for providing outstanding business value and thought leadership. Additionally, the National Governors Association has used Secure Colorado as a template for their policy academy multiple times to help lesser mature states develop a cybersecurity strategy. So here's a question. Does an award-winning security program mean that you'll never have a highly impactful security incident? Well, unfortunately, the answer to that question is no. So you may remember that Colorado fell victim to a SamSam ransomware attack in February of 2018 when it hit our Colorado Department of Transportation. It took their business operations offline for a month, forcing them to resort to workarounds and manual processes to continue to pay vendors and employees on time. Now, the response was huge. At one point, we had more than 130 people helping us to contain and eradicate the malware and to restore CDOT.
However, in the end, this is a story about having how having a good cybersecurity plan in place helps you to recover from a serious cybersecurity incident. Now, there were a few things that we had in our favor. So we had just completed a project called Backup Colorado. So we were confident that we were backing up all of CDOT's production servers and that those backups were offline and not affected by the ransomware. And we had tested this backup process and the ability to restore. And so we were very confident. So it never occurred to us to pay the ransom. We also had good network segmentation in place which prevented the spread of the malware from CDOT's business operations into their traffic operations environment. And it also prevented it from spreading to other state agencies. We also had a very good incident response plan in place and we had practiced this plan many, many times with many participants, including with our key incident response partners, the Colorado National Guard. And then because of our security program and our ongoing continuous efforts to improve security, we actually had many of the right tools and the right security efforts already underway. So in order for us to recover, it was relatively simple to accelerate many of our security projects to do such things such as limiting privilege access, implementing two-factor authentication for all of our remote access, implementing a brand new firewall for CDOT, and rolling out that endpoint detection and response tool set to prevent future occurrences and to protect the rest of the state. And we implemented many other security improvements as we were recovering without spending additional or unplanned money. And not only did we just implement these for CDOT, we implement all of these protections across the state to protect all of our state agencies. Now there was a quote that we really liked um, that was in a state scoop article. They said, if there's a playbook for bouncing back from a ransomware incident, it might resemble the one the Colorado Office of Information Technology developed last year when that state's transportation agency had its own run-in with the SAMSAM virus. So I want to present to you a contrasting business case that really illustrates the point that having a cybersecurity program in place helps you to recover from a cyber attack and helps you to contain the scope of the impact and the costs associated with the attack. So CDOT was hit with the SAMSAM -SAM ransomware attack in February of 2018. We spent about $1.7 million recovering. CDOT's business operations was offline for four weeks and we spent about eight weeks total recovering. CDOT expect, experienced very little data loss, certainly no data associated with any of their production systems was lost. We recovered 100% of that. And this incident did not affect the residents of our state at all, unless of course they were CDOT or OIT employees. Now contrast that with Atlanta who experienced the very same SAM SAM ransomware attack exactly a month later. Atlanta spent 10 times what we did, $17 million recovering, and greater than six months with one third of their services offline for three months or more. Atlanta suffered significant data loss, including 10 years of public safety data. And this incident had significant impact to the city of Atlanta and its residents. The urgency and priority of ransomware preparedness has really been elevated and it is top priority of the President of the United States. When CDOT was hit with ransomware, the impact was that almost 2000 of their systems were encrypted, making the data contained within unusable. However, a new type of ransomware is much more popular. Before the systems are encrypted, the data is copied. The threat is that if you don't pay the ransom, not only will your systems remain unusable, but the attackers will release your data and they will publish the fact that they've breached your organization very publicly. They call this name and shame. 
So, I mean, it's bad enough when a company or a state or local government suffers a ransomware attack, since it can cripple their business for a period of time while they attempt to recover. But it's even worse when it's combined with a data breach, because now they have to perform notifications to impacted individuals, to the attorney general's office, to federal agencies whose data may have been included in the breach, and potentially pay fines. And you may or may not be familiar with the term ransomware as a service. Ransomware as a service means that you don't have to be a skilled attacker to launch a ransomware attack. You can outsource every part of this attack, including a very professional service desk where victims can call and get help if they don't know how to buy Bitcoin to pay the ransom. Now, ransomware has been on the rise since 2016, and unfortunately, this trend is predicted to continue for several years. So I created a, a slide here that show a few statistics that demonstrate how impactful ransomware can be. For businesses and governments that are hit with ransomware, the average downtime is 21 days, and it typically takes around 287 days to fully recover. And more and more victims are actually paying the ransom than ever before. It's estimated that victims paid approximately $350 million in 2020, which is more than a 300% increase over 2019. And the average ransom demand has gone up too. The average payment is more than $312,000, which is almost double what the demand was in 2019. And of course, we know the demand can be huge if the attackers believe that the company can afford it. In 2021, we've already seen two huge notable ransomware attacks, the Colonial Pipeline, in which the ransomware demand was $4.4 million, and then JBS Meatpacking, in which the ransomware demand was $11 million. Now, in 2020, nearly 2,400 US-based governments, healthcare facilities, schools were victims of ransomware. And another scary statistic that I've just heard recently is that greater than 90% of those who actually pay the ransom don't get all of their data back. Now, cyber criminals did not slow down at all during the pandemic. In fact, the US Secret Service said that these attacks actually increased during the pandemic and that many of these were focused on the US healthcare and public health sector. And experts have predicted that the damage caused by ransomware could cost a worldwide amount of 265 billion by 2031. Since this type of cybercrime is attacking both enterprises and consumers at a rate of one attack every few seconds. Now the White House just recently came out with a memo. The memo was called What We Urge You to Do to Protect Against the Threat of Ransomware. And this was released in June. It included five best practices and then five additional recommendations, which are meant to provide guidance to help businesses to significantly reduce the risk of a successful cyber attack. Now, for each of these points, you'll see I've added a green check mark to indicate that we actually have each of these things in place. So the five best practices, multi-factor authentication, endpoint detection and response, encryption, a skilled empowered cybersecurity team, and then rapid patching and the incorporation of threat intelligence information. Now, one thing to note is that most of these best practices cannot be deployed to legacy technologies. So those older systems that may still be running important applications in our environment, they may not be able to accommodate these best practices. And I will talk more about that later. So in addition to the five best practices, the memo also contained five recommendations. So having a backup strategy, updating and patching systems promptly. That was so, in, so important. It was also included in the best practices testing your incident response plan, penetration testing, and network segmentation. So if you'll recall, network segmentation for us, it exists between all agencies and is the reason that the 2018 ransomware incident did not spread to additional agencies. 
Now, one additional control, this was not included in the White House memo, but based on OIT's 2018 experience with ransomware, we implemented privileged access management as a way to decrease the risk associated with ransomware. Now, privileged accounts are those accounts that have greater access privileges. Those are those accounts that are allowed to make changes to servers, to network infrastructure, to workstations, and to other systems within the state environment. OIT continues to inventory and reduce the numbers of privileged accounts and has added extra monitoring for these. And we've also implemented vaulting technology and multi-factor authentication to ensure that these accounts are checked out when needed and cannot be reused by attackers. Now, I wanna take a brief segue here and talk a little bit about unemployment insurance fraud. On this chart, you may recall hearing about some of these recent data breaches that occurred over the past years. In fact, you may recognize some of these because you yourself may have been a victim of one of these. I personally was a victim of three of these, lucky me. Um, in so many of these breaches, we weren't really even sure what was going to be done with the information collected, but we knew that it would probably come back to haunt us at some point. Now, cyber criminals often steal personally identifiable information, or PII, because it is worth money on the, on the cyber black market. Unemployment fraud actually occurred in all 50 states. And it was exacerbated by the pandemic and the relaxing of the typical restrictions and validations to help get money quickly into the hands of the people who need it. And the more public of a person you are, the easier it is for fraudsters to find information on you. Once they've got a name of a legitimate person, they can actually buy the PII data associated with your name, especially if you've been a victim of any of those cyber breaches. In a USA Today article, they interviewed a cyber criminal in January about this. He was a student in Nigeria. He estimated that he had made about $50,000 since the pandemic began in unemployment insurance fraud. He uses public sources of information to gather a list of names of legitimate people. And then he paid $2 in cryptocurrency to buy the stolen PII data, like date of birth and social security number that was associated with those names. The stolen PII data is widely available on the dark net because of all of those breaches that we saw on the last slide. And by the way, that was just a sample of breaches. There are many, many, many more breaches that have happened over the years that have exposed our PII data. So once the fraudster had that information, he used it then to file fraudulent unemployment claims on behalf of those individuals while attempting to get money redirected to himself. Now, Joe Barella, who is the executive director of CDLE, he wrote a really good article and he referenced this story. And he talked about the impact of CDLE and what CDLE has done in an attempt to cut down on this fraud. So CDLE launched MyUI Plus, a new unemployment insurance application, and they included sophisticated anti-fraud measures, which were estimated to have prevented between seven and $10 billion in fraudulent payments in January alone. So if like me, a fraudster filed an unemployment claim in your name, then like me, your PII is already for sale on the dark net. And then you may need to take steps to protect your credit. So you can get some very good information on CDLE's website, cdle.colorado.gov slash fraud dash prevention, or on a website supported by Colorado's attorney general, stopfraudcolorado.gov. So now I'm going to talk to you about some of the cybersecurity challenges that I need your help with. So I already mentioned legacy technology. Older network infrastructure, operating systems, and systems that we'd call legacy are difficult to secure because the vendor may no, no longer be supporting these, which means that as new cybersecurity threats are discovered, updates are not being released for these older systems. And modern security configurations like longer passwords or encryption or two-factor authentication may not be supported. 
Additionally, with most of our legacy systems, the individual have who the individuals who have knowledge of these systems become fewer and fewer over time, which creates a huge risk, especially as more and more of our workforce becomes retirement eligible. Now we have requested money as part of the American Recovery Plan to replace older legacy and outdated systems and to refresh and modernize state systems and infrastructure. When we modernize these systems, this will allow us to ensure that the system is hardened with current updates and patches, is configured with modern security and is architected with security built in is also more widely supportable by a greater number of current and prospective employees. Now, another challenge that we face is regarding the cybersecurity workforce. When I talk to other CISOs, whether they're local or across the nation, it really doesn't matter if they're private sector or public sector, we are all having the same problem, which is hiring and retaining skilled cybersecurity professionals. Now, CyberSeq said that within the past year, U.S. employers posted over 464,000 job openings for cybersecurity workers. And there are currently only around 956,000 cybersecurity professionals. So as you can see in Colorado, there are more than 17,000 open positions. To fill all of these, we need 50% more cybersecurity professionals in the workforce. I spend a lot of time talking with students about cybersecurity, mainly at the high school level, although though I do talk to students at the middle school and college level as well. And when I talk to students, I talk about all of the reasons that I think cybersecurity is a great career choice. And for those who are interested, I really hope to influence them to become our future cybersecurity workforce. Now, something else that we are doing a couple of years ago, we created a veterans transition program. This is a paid internship for veterans who have military cybersecurity or threat intelligence experience, or who have an interest in an aptitude and would like to get started with a cybersecurity career. We get the benefit of having their knowledge within our security operations center, and we train them on our tools to enable them to make a successful transition to the next phase of their career. Our goal is to hire many of these veterans directly into our program. In fact, we've hired eight of these awesome veterans permanently as full-time staff for the state. For those veterans that we aren't able to hire, with just nine months in our program, it puts resume-worthy skills on their resumes, and it enables them to land really good cybersecurity jobs with other agencies or in the private sector. This program is truly the best pipeline that I've ever experienced. And I like to say it's a win, win, win. It's a win for us. It's a win for the veterans. And it's helping to address the nationwide cybersecurity workforce gap. Now, I want to talk a little bit about local governments. A very important statewide, statewide risk is local governments because local governments provide so many critical services to their communities. And they're often very under-resourced and under-prepared in the area of cybersecurity. And when the services that local governments provide are disrupted, it can be extremely impactful and may even put lives at risk. This data is related to ransomware incidents affecting state, local, tribal, and territorial governments nationwide over the past several years. Now, this information presented is only that of known ransomware incidents. Oftentimes, entities who suffer a ransomware event are successful at keeping it private. So we actually have no idea regarding the actual numbers. But as you can see, Publicly known ransomware attacks aimed at state, local, tribal, and territorial governments continue to increase year after year. Now, this is a summary of all the publicly recorded cyber incidents in Colorado over the past three years. And as you can see, these two have grown each year. And of course, there are probably more Colorado incidents that are not listed here because they were not made public. The cost of a data breach is a well-known IBM study 
and it's published annually. And it states that the highest cost saver to organizations responding to a cyber incident is having an incident response plan and team in place. In fact, the average cost of responding to a cyber incident with a plan versus without a plan represents a $2 million difference. And so that you can get a sense of how well Colorado lo local governments in Colorado are or are not prepared, I wanted to present you with two different surveys that we conducted in 2020. So this first survey was sent to local governments in partnership with the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security All Hazards Cyber Subcommittee. Of the more than 3,000 local governments in Colorado, we received 172 responses. Of these responses, 33% reported that they have an incident response plan in place. 67% reported they do not have an incident response plan in place. Now, our theory is that the bulk of the organizations who did not respond to our cybersecurity survey, especially after multiple attempts at trying to get them to respond, probably didn't respond because they either didn't have any cybersecurity personnel, they didn't understand or feel comfortable with the questions, and that probably means they do not have an incident response plan. So that means that less than 5% of local governments in Colorado have an incident response plan. So if they are hit by a cybersecurity attack, the possible impact will be more serious, the duration to the business will be longer, and the cost for them to recover will be far greater than if they had a plan. So this second survey was conducted by the Colorado Secretary of State's office, and it was sent to counties only to determine how prepared they were for election support prior to the 2020 presidential election. 50 of the 64 Colorado counties responded. 30% reported they do not have a dedicated security team. And 15% of the responders said they don't have any internal IT resources at all. So together, these surveys really tell the story that with a few exceptions, local governments are extremely unprepared in the area of cybersecurity and in responding to cybersecurity threats. Now, many local government cybersecurity personnel have actually been discussing this problem for a few years now. And they've been talking about how hard it is to get the support they need they determined there had to be a better way forward. So in September of 2019, about 30 individuals, mainly representing local governments, came together for a working session. They described this meeting as them deciding to stop waiting for someone else to solve their cybersecurity problem and to take the initiative to develop the plan themselves. Now, in addition to local governments, there were also individuals representing the Secretary of State Office, the Colorado Information of Technology, the Office of Emergency Management, the State Fusion Center, the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, and the Department of Homeland Security. There were only a couple of parameters this group used when developing the plan. Uh, firstly, they said there are over 3,000 local governments in Colorado and this plan needs to support them all. And it should support them all getting to a minimum baseline of security for the least amount of money out of their pockets. They also encouraged each other, each other to think big. They said, if there are no limiting factors, no political, no limitations based on jurisdictions, what should this look like? And the team created what they originally called the 10-year plan. The idea was, it'll probably take us 10 years to deploy these ideas. Um, in 2020, this 10-year plan was adopted by a larger group and it was renamed the Whole of State Cybersecurity Approach. The Whole of State Cybersecurity Approach has six goals. So firstly, to establish cybersecurity partnerships. Now we do have some of these in place, but we wanna do a job, a better job of highlighting, promoting and partnering with our academic centers of excellence. And we also wanna develop partnerships to enhance those cybersecurity skills with an eye towards workforce development. Goal number two is to establish a state defense force 
we are planning to develop our own instant response capabilities with partnership from government technology and cybersecurity personnel representing local governments across the state. And part of this goal will also include proactive security assessments so that local governments know what efforts they should be prioritizing for their cybersecurity programs. This will likely include the development of agreements with the private sector for incident response as well. Goal number three is to establish a cybersecurity set a cyber security range. And we are partnering with the National Cybersecurity Center specifically to fill this goal. The cyber range will be used in our training efforts to ensure that all of our local incident responders have consistent cybersecurity and incident response skills. This will also be the platform for workforce development, whether these are students or individuals wanting to build upon their cybersecurity skills. Goal number four will be to establish a cyber support center. And the National Cybersecurity Center has hired an individual and is helping to build this capability. Now, as this matures, we envision this as both a place to get assistance and guidance where you can talk to a live person as well as a place to access resources that are written to be useful and helpful for local governments, especially those with limited, if any, cybersecurity expertise. And goal number five is to establish a funding program. Now, not only is the intent of this goal to figure out how we will fund our efforts, but also to put those purchasing agreements in place that allow small local governments to be able to purchase cybersecurity tools and services with the volume discounts that a larger entity such as the state is able to get. And then lastly, goal number six is to establish threat intelligence sharing and community collaboration. Now we have this at least partially in place in our community. We call it the Colorado Threat Information Sharing Network or CTIS. However, we don't have nearly enough local governments signed up yet and we don't have anywhere near the amount of collaboration occurring, occurring that we would like to see. So we do have a couple of questions to be resolved, such as what gives us the authority or jurisdiction to guide or assist local governments? And then how will we recover or fund those cybersecurity efforts? Because as a state government, we have no jurisdiction over local governments and we have no ability to recuperate any of the money for services that we provide to local governments. So we envision using the Governor's Cybersecurity Council to help us address statutory authority for providing those services to local governments and to help determine how, we're, how will this be funded. And then also to help determine where should these services live? Should it live within Public Safety's Office of Emergency Management or the Governor's Office of Information Technology or the Secretary of State's Office or the National Cybersecurity Center or someplace else? Now, we are currently partnering with the National Cybersecurity Center to build out the cyber range, as mentioned, and the cyber support center. In fact, the NCC has been a great partner in helping us to continue to evolve our whole of state cybersecurity efforts. We are also working with the Colorado Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management to think through how we might use some of the Homeland Security grant funding in fiscal year 23 and in future years to help build and maintain your, this program. So now I'm gonna talk about where we need your help. The whole of state cybersecurity approach, the governor's Council membership was refreshed with the OIT statutory refresh and charged with helping with the whole of state cybersecurity approach. So this council will be reconvening in the next couple of months to help with a recommendation regarding policy changes and funding needed to help build and support the cybersecurity services that local governments need. They are required to produce a report with their recommendations by July of 2022, and we expect that there will be a funding request attached to that. The expansion of the Veterans Transition Program, you'll likely see a decision item that we'll be asking you to fund for fiscal year 2022 to help us to expand this program. 
and then the reduction of technical debt. So similar to what other states are doing, we are asking for American Recovery Plan funding to help eliminate legacy technology, replacing it instead with modernized government systems. So we are really hoping that we can count on your support for each of these items. Um, and then lastly, I want to open this up for questions and answer any questions you might have. And then I also included my email address and also Larry Hofer's email address so that if you think of questions later, you can contact us and ask, um, ask any questions. So feel free. I will stop sharing my screen and then perhaps I can see if there are any questions. Let's see, I do see some questions in the Q&A. Um, so Senator Jeff Bridges, do we have a good way of tracking who in Colorado is being attacked with these types of attacks and how often our Colorado business and governments pay those ransoms? I know there was some talk at the federal level about requiring disclosure of payments, but not sure where that ended up. That is a great question, Senator Bridges. Um, we don't necessarily have any way of tracking. I can see those attacks that are coming into state government. And so I can see what agencies are under attack. But as far as other businesses, I don't have any way of seeing that. And certainly for local governments, there's no requirement currently that local governments report to the state any of their attacks or any of their you know, issues, uh, incidents, um, whether or not they paid the ransom, there's no reporting requirement. I do know that I've heard some talk at a federal level of requiring this type of disclosure. I don't think it's come to fruition yet. I think there are some states, I believe Texas was successful in passing some um, legislation that requires local governments at least, I don't know about businesses, but local governments to report to the state um, for cybersecurity incidents. And it may also have a reporting requirement for um, whether they've paid ransom or not. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure Colorado doesn't have anything in place like that. So that may be something that we would think about for the future. Um, another question, how does our shift to an API approach impact the privileged access management program? Relatedly, how many different applications and databases across the state are included with this privileged access management approach? Fantastic question. You like dug into the nuances of what we're doing. So the first year that we implemented the privileged access management program, we uh, concentrated on domain access privileges. And so we rolled it out and we are managing our domain privileged accounts at this point. This next year, we are focusing on databases, applications, services accounts, all of those will be implemented into the program. Um, so all of those accounts will be vaulted. Um, applications will have to integrate to the privileged access management tool to essentially check out those accounts when needed. Um, this will ensure that those accounts cannot be reused and cannot be used to sort of replay against us to compromise sensitive data. Now, I'm sure there's a lot more technical information that you'd want to know about this, and I'm not the right person to answer it. But if you want to contact me, I'll put you in touch with our identity and access management expert who can dig into those nuances. But you are absolutely shift, you are absolutely correct in that shifting to API is the right way to do this. And um, it's the right way to make to take advantage of automated capabilities for checking out those privileged accounts versus hard coding them into code in our applications. That's the wrong way to do it. So, um, so that is what we're moving to and you are absolutely correct there. Um, another great question. What certificate do you need to work in cybersecurity? Is some version of what's needed offered by our community colleges? If so, how can we get more high school students to get that certificate while they are still in high school? Fantastic question. Um, and when I talk with students, I, 
I recommend that they take cybersecurity classes in high school. Um, when I was in high school, these were not offered at all. That's how old I am. But now students can actually take these in school. Another thing that I recommend is that they participate in Cyber Patriots. Cyber Patriots is a competition that most schools or many, many schools have. It's like a club. Um, and it's a nationwide competition where these students learn how to defend their systems against cyber attack. Um, cyber Patriots gives them great real life experience on cybersecurity things like how to harden systems, how to write policies, how to be a cybersecurity professional. And it gives them great experience for when they enter the future workforce. Students can go right out of high school, right into the cybersecurity workforce. They absolutely can do that. Um, so I recommend that they join Cyber Patriots, get some real world, world experience, take some cybersecurity classes in high school certifications. There is one called Security Plus. That is probably one of the best security certifications for them to get. And their high school, depending on where they go to school, may be offering others. Community colleges absolutely offer these security certificates. And they know that we are at a workforce deficit. They know not all students go to four-year university. So high schools and community colleges are starting to offer these types of classes, skills, and certifications to get students into the workforce. And we are so appreciative of that. Um, here's another great question. What near-term legislative measures do you need to address the jurisdictional issues to support local governments? Fantastic question. Um, and that's what we hope to put the Governor's Cybersecurity Council to work thinking about. Um, but right now, local governments, we live in a state that's essentially home ruled, which means local governments are in charge of their own domain. The state is not in charge. So at a very minimum, we need some sort of statutory authority to allow the state or you know, whoever we determine would be the right place to kind of build these services to put in a minimum baseline standard to tell local governments, you must you know, adopt the NIST cybersecurity framework or adopt the CIS critical controls or adhere to statewide policies. Right now, there's nothing that tells them they must do that. So we need something like that. Now, local governments are very concerned that that would be, for them, an unfunded mandate. So we need to think about how will we fund local governments sort of coming up to speed. If we tell them, you must, how can we help them come up to speed? Um, secondly, it would be really helpful if we had some notification requirements like the state of Texas does, like I think the state of North Carolina does, and some other states do as well, that require local governments to notify the state when they have come under attack, when they've had a cyber incident, when they've responded uh, to a cyber incident. It does a couple of things. It helps us to track better what's going on in our state so that we can better see what those needs are. It also could allow us to assist if we had the capability to assist. So those are a couple of things that we need to try to figure out. And I really appreciate the question. It shows that you're interested in helping me figure this out. Thank you for that. Um, another great question. Thank you for describing the overwhelming number of cyber threats. My constituents are mostly concerned about voting systems integrity. As an independent agency, does the Secretary of State participate in the cybersecurity threat awareness and mitigation community of the state like Secure Colorado? So Secretary of State is a fantastic partner. And in fact, the Colorado Information Threat Sharing uh, Network, CTIS, was their idea and they created it and they started it up as a way to make their counties and their election officials um, and the IT staff in over the election systems aware of threats. And they allowed us to participate and allowed us to broaden it. So they are absolutely a fantastic partner. That monthly meeting that I talked about where all of the state security leaders come together, Secretary of State participates every single month. Um, they have a fantastic CTO um, and CISO in charge of security, as well as a fantastic CIO, all of which 
really understand the threats to the election system and are very, very good uh, partners in cybersecurity professionals themselves. Um, so they are absolutely participating. They, um, you know, I often brag that I think Colorado is probably one of the best prepared states in the nation as far as our election systems because of their efforts. So thank you for the question. Um, another question. Is the legislative box account encrypted? That's a great question for Larry Hofer, um, uh, but I am confident that it is because I have actually looked into that box technology. It's really good technology um, and it they do have encryption built in. And um, I'm assuming that you have an enterprise license for that, which gives you a lot of great capabilities. So I would assume that it is, but definitely follow up with Larry Hofer and he can get you more details about that. Uh, let's see. Um, here's a question about Box versus Dropbox. Um, and here's my answer. Any consumer version of anything, so whether it's Box or whether it's Dropbox or even whether it's Google, if you're using it as a private individual, um, look into those consumer the consumer terms and uh, what's the E stand for? T and E terms and I forget agreements or whatever. Um, look into those terms. Make sure that you as an individual are okay with those terms. If you're okay with those terms, then it's okay for your individual consumer data. Now, if you are with an enterprise, you are going to want to look in what is the, look into what is the right tool for your enterprise. What can you put an enterprise agreement in place? And then how confident are you with your enterprise data? So I would say, you know, I would lean typically more towards Box because they have a good enterprise platform and an enterprise agreement that many enterprises are willing to adopt. Again, talk with Larry, find out if you, the legislative branch, have the enterprise agreement um, and the enterprise version of Box. Um, and then just make sure that, you know, again, that you are comfortable that the data that you're putting in there either, um, you know, is protected for you as a consumer or that your enterprise has an agreement in place that is protecting that. What else? What else can I answer? <laughs> These have been fantastic questions. Thank you all so much. And thank you so really much Debbie, for your responses. And I, I think if there aren't, oh, if there aren't any further questions, then I think um, we, we will call it a good, a good day. And, um, and Debbie, did you have any other final thoughts that you wanted to share? No, just thank you again so much for attending. I really do appreciate, you know, we in Colorado have had so much historical and current support from our legislators. And it's the reason that we've been able to grow our cybersecurity program the way we have. And so I just couldn't miss this opportunity to say thank you so much for your support um, and for the way that you've um, you know, been attentive to cybersecurity and to the needs of our agency over the years. Thank you so much and thank you for attending and feel free to reach out to me if there's any questions I can ever answer at any point in the future. 100%. Thank you so much, Debbie, for your leadership, truly. And uh, thank you to all of our legislators and staff who attended today. It was a real pleasure being with you this morning, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.